Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions. I'm Anisha Gupta. And there is uncertainty gripping India's agriculture commodity space yet again as it faces the brunt of climate change. After heat wave conditions and unprecedented rains, a possible delay in the onset of monsoon is casting a fresh shadow over the sector. The delay will hurt farmers for whom a normal monsoon means a good sowing season for key crops such as rice, cotton, corn, soya bean and sugar cane. It will also impact other agricultural activities. To discuss these issues and what they mean for commodity prices, we have an amazing panel of agri-tech companies. I am though first joined by Prateek Gadia, who is founder and CEO at the Yan Bazaar. Prateek, hi, good to have you. And I want to start with cotton because we've seen one, the price movement so much. From the highs of last year, we're down by nearly 35%. In the Indian markets, we just about continue to see further decline in cotton prices. What your platform does is it introduces or gets together the buyers and sellers what is it? How do you see the business right now? The fragmented, uh, you know, attribute of the whole sector. How is it helping? Of course, uh, you know, as you said, the market has not been very predictable. I think it has been predictably unpredictable. A lot of volatility with respect to prices across the valuation farm to fashion. Uh, what is really important is either the stability to kick in, which we at least at the young bazaar we don't foresee. So we are hoping for a lot of kind of changes in the industry. Number one, we expect the industry, which is a core manufacturing industry, to kind of have an outlook of a service industry, mm. which means you have to focus on key attributes like quality, uh, you know, uh, innovation and design, policy making, a lot of these issues to kind of, you know, still, uh, you know, uh, go through these tough times. Mm. Pratik, as of now, the way cotton prices are, uh, you know, when you see prices decline so much, there are a bit of sowing concerns as well on whether the farmers will sow as much. And then you have the onset of monsoon, which already is delayed. How do you see that impacting? We have seen its, you know, direct impact with prices. Uh, last time when we interacted over a different format, you know, we discussed that suddenly last two months there has been about 90 to 95 lakh bees that have come to the market mm. right which signifies that you know it, it's it's not something usual you know it's very unusual which signifies that there was a lot of voting going on which has kind of impacted the cotton prices which has significantly come down you know since our last interaction now this year although we are currently standing at about 290 approx bales we are expecting the season to close in about 320 bales or so but as far as sowing is concerned See, sowing has a big dependency on monsoon in India. Mm. And because of delayed monsoon, indoor at least, you know, we are hearing decent reports. But Punjab Belt is very concerning. In fact, some reports are stating that the sowing in Punjab has been the least from the last 10 years. You know, which, which could be a very concerning figure. But on the other hand, looking at the demand both domestic and international in terms of cotton exports, since that has not been that great, uh, we are expecting this particular year, I mean, this uh, year to kind of end at our closing stock, over 20 lakh bales or so. Mm. So in case we have a high closing stock and the sowing is not that great, I think next day still can be managed. Mm. So uh, tell us on what and how much of a penetration has the Yarn Bazaar done within this very fragmented space? So as you said, the space is highly uh, fragmented, but what is really important for us to note is, is that it's a large industry, right? In terms of the market size, uh, Indian textiles or Indian yarn itself is a huge industry, highly unorganized, which means, you know, which is where we come in. The Yarn Bazaar's vision is about organizing this large unorganized industry. And the only way we strongly believe that can happen is by empowering smaller buyers and suppliers, because 85% is smaller players. Right. So our penetration in terms of our inbound pipeline has been great. Uh, you know, we were featured on Shark Tank season one, so which also gave us good visibility. But what we have done in terms of value proposition has led more to, you know, the word of mouth and inbound pipeline. Uh, we've got more than 10, 15,000 textile companies which are registered with us now. And the idea is to kind of, when it comes to a small young manufacturer, then kind of streamline their entire activity from procurement to payment. So P2P is a process where that involves manufacturing, that involves quality concerns. So, you know, improving their efficiency, improving the capacity utilization, because we've seen, and again, you can look at a lot of reports, spinning means, especially in the South, which are young manufacturers, their average capacity utilization has dropped below 50%. And so that's where it's very important for us to kind of empower them in terms of increasing their uh, capacity utilization, which although 
you know, there has a direct impact on their ROC, which is return on capital employed, mm. which is what we want to do on the young manufacturing side. And as far as fabric manufacturers are concerned, who are actually young consumers, the idea is to again kind of streamline their entire sourcing. So to become like a sourcing solution for them, giving them the right price, mm. uh, you know, the right quality and on time in full delivery. Mm. We also do understand that you are looking to go global here. Talk to us about that and what is the plan going forward? Uh, at some point, we definitely want to go global because, you know, we India is, again, you know, one country in the world which has an entire ecosystem from farm to fashion. And primarily in some of the other form, we are exporting, you know, whether it's cotton or yarn or fabric or apparel. So at some point, we definitely intend to go global. But as of today, the idea is to stick to, you know, still stick to the domestic industry, solve for the broken supply chain problem here. And then look at global. By that time, we would have kind of consolidated the fragmented supplier base, streamlined their quality, ensured consistency of quality, and like a timely delivery to our international partners also. So the moment we feel comfortable that we've streamlined the you know the domestic supply chain is when we would go start going global. Fair point that. So 15,000 companies already registered. The capacity utilization empowering is what Yan Bazar is working at. Going global and, of course, making a change in the cotton market in India, which is, by the way, one of the biggest industries in the country, but also very, very fragmented. Pati, thank you so much for joining us and taking us through on what Yan Bazaar does. But there are concerns when you look at this current season and monsoon onset not coming in. Irrigation is something that we continue to talk about at all times. We are now joined by Randhir Chauhan. He's Managing Director of NetFM India. Randhir, hi, good to have you. And I'm, I think you're the man of the movement because there are just so many concerns. And while we keep talking about drip irrigation, Tell us on how much of penetration have we seen in the country versus the potential? So uh, about 71 million uh, hectares is the potential Manisha and about 14 million has been covered. Although we know the agriculture happens on 141 million hectares. So versus the irrigated area is 20% versus agriculture is uh, less than 10%. Mm. Randhir, also, what are global learnings into this one and what states in India are doing better than the others when it comes to drip irrigation? See, the five states uh, cover like 9 million hectares, which are like Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, then Gujarat, Ma Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. So these are, and Karnataka, these are the key states where this has happened much before the other states. Uh, although the other states remain very potential and I'm really optimistic that this will kick off. You know, we, you know, we are hearing about this delay. Necessarily, it's an uncertainty. Either the monsoon will be late, uh, there will be a gap, it will start late or end soon. In this, you know, micro-irrigation, the drip technology is kind of a, a, a mitigating factor. So you can use water uh, as you wish and you need only 50% of, uh, of water yeah, versus the flood irrigation. So I'm really a bit uh, this year for the entire drip irrigation space. Hmm. Nandi, talk to us also about the investments that you see, the cropping patterns, especially in an year where the onset is delayed and it also is an El Nino year on top of that. See, for farmers, no, uh, another one week or 10 days, nothing will change. But hmm. let's say... The delay is beyond July, no? then it will really hit uh, crops like seed, pulses, and also millets, wherein uh, farmers will start uh, thinking about doing a different crop. And that might really create uh, some panic uh, in some of the commodities. Mm. Randhir, you also are present uh, globally. I mean, as I said, uh, what is the global learning out of this? Because the way climate change is happening, it is going to be more technology driven, the whole farming as a scene and uh, more innovations would be required, more R&D perhaps would be required as well. Absolutely. So you work on following areas. One is that how do you um, organize the sector more? So instead of working on your gut feeling, how do you do agriculture mostly on information, data and practices? And that's where I think India has a great advantage. Many startups, many organizations, we, we do by ourselves, we are investing into many of the startups. I think one is acting agri in agriculture on the basis of information will may, is, is a global learning. Uh, we need to start mitigating that data, giving that data to farmers and helping them make decisions based on information is one. Two is that mechanization has no other alternate. We need to make sure that you know, people can work in all weathers. We cannot expect people 
keep continue working in 42, 46 degrees in agriculture. And we have to take these people out and give them a certain environment to work. I think these are two major factors. Mm -hmm. You know, as we go ahead, and there are various reports suggesting that, Randhi, that we, as we move forward from here, there's going to be less water available. There's going to be less arable land available as well. But the population will continue to increase. How are you then looking at drip irrigation work in favor of that? See, two, there are two uh, different scenarios in this. You know, if you talk about India, in most of the cases, our average yield is at least 30, 40 percent less than even our southeast, uh, southeast uh, neighbors. Forget about the global standards. So first of all, we have a huge opportunity to catch up with the global average of the yields. And that's where drip irrigation makes a big difference. And then comes the issue of, you know, whether we need so much of area under cultivation to feed this. This is a global challenge. Uh, companies are working on A, is that how can we have a different seed material and the varieties where you actually need less water? Two, is that how do we move on to high nutrition, uh, how nutrition, high nutrition food compared to what we do now? I think it's a, it's a bigger challenge and needs to be tackled in multiple ways. Mm. Randeer, a, a final question. Talk to us also about on how is the current Kharif season then looking to you? I mean, you've said already that week 10 days of a delay doesn't really bother the farmers. Anything more than that would. So how is this Kharif season looking? I know you have done a lot of work with rice as a cultivation too. So Kharif, I think, as I said, uh, even the recent IMD doesn't say that uh, this, uh, this is going to be a, a lesser monsoon or it still shows 94%. I think 94% is a very good level. So I'm really not uh, panic about it. I think it's going to be a good Kharif season. Yes, there might be a couple of geographies where the stress will be higher than the others. All right. So no concerns as of now. And many of the tech companies clearly are ready when they're looking at agriculture. There are a lot of opportunities as well. But uh, really uh, losing time when it comes to monsoon as an onset. Randeep, thank you so much for joining us. But on that note, it's time for a very short break. But don't go anywhere. The discussion continues. And this time around with Karthik Jairaman of Vekul Foods when we return. Welcome back. You're watching Commodity Champions. Staying with agriculture, we will now be diving into the supply chain management and technology driving the agri space. Joining me now to take this discussion forward is Karthik Jairaman, co-founder and managing director at Vekul Foods. Karthik, hi, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, you are a company which is in food development and distribution. What is the potential that you see into the Indian market with this? What is uh, the difference that you're making on ground and what are the challenges? I think, uh, as we know, India is a country that moved from food deficient to food surplus very recently. Mm. The past 60 years, efforts have been on focusing on making sure we have enough food to feed our population. Now we're starting, as the country moves from being a developing country to a middle-income country, we're starting to see the upgrade of the kind of food that we eat, the nutrition levels, whether we can add value to the food and offer convenience to the consumers, and so on. So we see that we are at the beginning of a very long S curve that will continue for quite some time to come as India moves to become a middle income country and then beyond. Mm -hmm. And we want to play a role in that. Clearly. Uh, you were founding in 2020 15, uh, Karthik. How would you say the journey has been for the last seven, eight years? It's been intense. I think uh, the sector is extremely unorganized and every commodity has its nuances, as you're well aware. We've been learning the nuances of each of these commodities while also building depth in our supply chain, which we believe is critical to build a sustainable model over here. The closer we are to the farmer and the more directly we are able to reach the product to the consumer, I think the better off we are. And that requires quite a bit of operational intensity. It also requires quite a bit of technology in the form of demand planning. Uh, you know, most of our supply chains have been pushed led. So farmers grow what they grow and we push the product down the supply chain. What we're trying to do is to see what is that the consumer demands and can we align harvesting and eventually production to this? That requires a lot of predictive capabilities, a considerable amount of AI deployment, which we have learned over the years, and now we have enough data to get better at it continuously. Mm. 
Mm. And just when you're doing that, monsoon plays a spoil sport. I mean, the last three years were all right when it comes to monsoon and weather as well. I mean, this is going to be a challenge in year, Karthik. How are you looking at it? It'll be an interesting year, Manisha, for two reasons. One is, of course, there's been a slight delay already. A delay of up to a week to 10 days doesn't matter much. But if it gets beyond that, then sowing will be affected. And if it is delay plus deficiency in the early stages, where the probability in my view is quite low, mm. then it may have an impact on rain-fed crops. My, uh, the, what, what will be interesting to watch more than the delay is the effect of El Nino. My guess is it will not matter much this year because the effect is supposed to be in the second half of the year. Mm. And uh, in any case, uh, you know, the rain-fed crops would have received what they received. Uh, it may, uh, you know, and uh, rice and other crops in Northwest, which is likely to be affected, are anyway not purely rain fed, they are also irrigated. But on ongoing effects, we will have to see. Mm. The wrinkle in all of this is the intensity of the summer. Will that translate into cloud bursts? In which case, some of the sowing, uh, sowed crops may be affected as well. So it's going to be interesting and it's, uh, it's not very predictable, to be honest. Absolutely. Uh, directionally, it looks okay for this season, but we'll have to see. Yeah, this uncertainty, unpredictability that we have seen across. I mean, when was the last time you felt so uncertain in your Kartik? So for us, uh, because we're in the supply chain, it's not just the supply which affects us, but every activity along the way. And from that point of view, you've seen the impact of climate, especially since we operate in southern India over the last several years now. We've been, we've seen three floods, two cyclones hit us and several uh, such factors affect us pretty much throughout our existence. Mm -hmm. So in a way it helps because we have to build a model that's naturally resilient towards this. But we can see the effect. And uh, so what we're seeing now is not unusual and uh, it's not restricted to sowing alone. We will see this along the supply chain. Mm. You also done recent tie-ups with IIT Madras, Tamil Nadu Agri University, Yara India. What does it bring on table for you? See, the intent here is to uh, build a platform where we can pro uh, bring agility into agriculture. And uh, the agility needs to be brought in through domain knowledge as well as technology. If we can establish a uh, regenerative agriculture stack, which is what IIT Madras Pravatak uh, Foundation has built, uh, and we can bring this to the farmer, we should be able to use uh, uh, the data that's available to continually provide guidance to the farmers on what is the action they need to take the week after and so on. For example, within our own stack, we have built an irrigation management system mm. where we have an IoT device that we can offer to the farmer that can tell them what the likely impact of local weather is and how much irrigation should they do and should they do it at all. Now, in some crops, we put another layer on top of it where we are able to predict the onset of certain diseases with reasonable accuracy. And as we get more data, this gets more and more accurate. This helps the farmer take evasive action rather than corrective action after the disease has struck. These, would, these kind of interventions will become more and more frequently required hmm. for farmers as the climate uncertainties start to kick in. These are all part of climate adaptation. And that's really what we want to do in partnership with IIT Madras Pravatak Foundation, as well as some of the input partners that we are working with. Clearly. So, you know, we do understand that there are nearly 1,400 plus agri-tech companies in India right now. Would you say that we, uh, again, a question really, uh, what is the potential and what is the penetration? How much on-ground difference is it really making? Very, very early days, Manisha. Honestly, 1,400 agri-tech uh, Companies in a, a country where there are 150 million landed farmers is nothing. Mm. And uh, I think we will need a lot more. Uh, we will all find our spaces, but honestly, we are probably at very early stages, touching maybe 1 to 5% of the population at best. So a long way to go. All right, way, uh, way Cool Foods is another of your uh, uh, you know, uh, enterprise there. Uh, what is the plan going forward from here, Karthik? So Vehicle has been focused on building the supply chain between the farm gate and the retail point mm. for fresh produce, grains, and dairy. What we're doing now is to increase our penetration in southern India. We're already present here, and we will remain focused in southern India, where we want to be there in every town that's above 5,000 in population. Uh, we also want to procure uh, deeper uh, the range of commodities that we deal with, add value to the products. We've already launched a range of brands which have uh, started getting very good traction of both commodity products as well as value-added products such as flowers and uh, uh, you know processed foods. We will be doing more of this and therefore consolidating our presence in southern India and penetrating deeper into the market.
Point well said then. Yeah, clearly, there are expansion plans there, but as you said, Karthik, that so many agriculture companies, but even then with that, there is 2 to 5 percent of a reach that we've seen on ground there. So clearly, plenty to be done. And uh, congratulations on all the efforts that you are making on ground there. But with that, that's all the time that we have on this edition of Commodity Champions. Don't go anywhere because news continues right here on CNBC TV 18.